Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we sing for joy because you have kept your promises. In your everlasting and steadfast love, you sent your Son to save us from the punishment of sin and to restore us back to yourself. It is because of his blessed work that we can be brought to your holy city. Every week, you mercifully and lovingly gather us to yourself and give us the privilege of being amongst your saints and your life giving presence. We know that you really do this because you tell us this in your word, and your word is truth. We do not see all of the heavenly saints around us worshiping us with worshiping you with us today, but we know that it is real. Elisha's servant didn't see your heavenly army surrounding them, but Elisha prayed that you would open his eyes, and you did. Your word tells us that by faith, or that faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. And Father, we will not let go of your word or your promises because we know that you are the one true and only God. You are full of love and mercy, and you have shown us that in the life and the work of your son Jesus, strengthen our faith today by opening the eyes of our hearts to see your amazing glory we beg. You've told us to ask and it will be given to you. Our Lord Jesus prayed to you once saying, Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am to see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. Father, let us worship, let our worship be real. Help it to be real. Thank you for bringing us into your presence. And we pray these things in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> Our Old Testament scripture reading this morning comes from Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 through 17. You can find that on page 16 in your front of your hymnal. Hear the word of the Lord. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the heaven or is in the earth beneath or that is in the water underneath the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. 
Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter or your male servant or your female servant or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that is in your neighbor's house. In the back of your hymnal on page 852 is the Nicene Creed. Brothers and sisters, let's confess this together as we do once a month with the Nicene Creed. Let us confess together what it is that we believe. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father before all worlds, God of God, and light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the Scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits on the right hand of the Father. And he shall come again with glory to judge the living and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets, and I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead in the life of the world to come. Amen. Let's go before the Lord now in a time of confession and supplication. The heavens declare your glory, O God, and the sky above proclaims your handiwork, your eternal power and divine nature have been clearly perceived in the things that you have made, so that they are fools who say without excuse there is no God. Your word tells us this. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. We come before you this morning and we recognize your greatness, your infinite, eternal, and unchangeable in all of your attributes. And we recognize that we are not. We are weak. We sin. We change. We cannot find out the the deep things of God. We cannot find out the limits of the Almighty. But you are great and greatly to be praised, and your greatness is unsearchable. Who is a God like you, O Lord? Majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds, doing wonders through your word. Who in the skies, said the psalmist, could be compared to the Lord? Who among the heavenly beings is like the Lord? who is mighty as you are with your faithfulness all around you. There is none like you, nor are there any works like yours. And so as we come to worship you this morning, as we are invited into your house, into your very presence through our Lord and Savior Jesus, who opened the way for us, we pray, O oh Lord, that you would accept the offering that we bring, even our very lives, and you would forgive us of our sins, cleanse us from unrighteousness, that you would teach us your ways, that we might walk in 
your paths, that we might honor you in all that we do, that we might purge sin from our lives, that your Holy Spirit would work in our hearts through the word that is heard today, the word that is read, the word that is preached, that your Holy Spirit would not stop working with that word in our hearts throughout this week, that he would apply it to every circumstance in which we find ourselves, that we might be a testimony of your attributes of your holiness that the Holy Spirit would work in us that which we have heard, that we might work it out through our hands, through our lips, that we might show the world the goodness of God, that we might be a light that shines in a dark place, that we might have a testimony that transcends what we alone can do, but that unbelievers would be directed to look to you, that they would find there the answers that they're looking for, and that we might be able to know your word to show them, not only with our lives, the way that we live, the way that we have confidence in your word, the way that our lives have changed, the way that we walk a new path, but also that we might be able to open our Bibles and give them answers to questions to which they've not been able to find answers. As we turn to your word this morning, we pray that we might see the work of Jesus and we might find in Jesus and in his mother as we look at John this morning, the way in which we ought to trust in Christ in all things, that we ought to trust that you know what you are doing and that you will work your will perfectly. We thank you that you are the bridegroom, as your word puts it, and your church is the bride, that you are perfecting us, that even though sin remains in us and that still attracts us, that nevertheless you are making your bride beautiful. Sanctify us and continue to sanctify us, that we might be presented to the Father, a pure and spotless bride. We pray for those who cannot be with us today, that you would watch over them. For those who are traveling, that you would grant to them safety. For those who are sick, that you would raise them back to health. But we pray uh, particularly that you would be with our brother, Pastor Tom, that you would watch over him. We also pray uh, that you would be with Doug Barcroft as he continues to recover from surgery, that uh, he I would be able to return soon to the church where he has so faithfully served you and will continue to do so. We pray that you would be with the work of missions as it takes place all over the globe. We think of the work in Uruguay and the works in Uganda. Lord, we pray that the gospel goes forth there in power. We pray for those uh, indigenous um, ministers who are being trained and elders who are being trained, that they would learn your word, that they would seek after it faithfully, uh, that they would be convinced, convicted of the uh, Reformed faith, not as a matter of convenience, but as a matter of genuine conviction. And we pray that you would grant the resources needed to train uh, these folks in the Word of God so that they too may be presented mature, spotless bride. And now we ask as we continue our service that you might be honored and glorified in what we do uh, that you may open our ears, that we might hear our eyes, that we might see, that we might glorify you even as we listen of the glorious deeds of our Lord and Savior Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Our assurance of pardon comes from Isaiah chapter 55 and verse 7. Let to the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord, that he may have compassion on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon him. Let's worship the Lord now through the giving of our tithes and offerings. Let's take up our Psalter portion of the Psalter hymnal to Psalm 71. We'll sing verses 1 through 4. In you, Lord, I take refuge. Psalm 71, and let's stand together as we sing. Rock of 
be seated and turn to the Gospel of John, the second chapter. A motion picture engineers uh, classify the most dramatic sounds in movies uh, to include a baby's cry, the blast of a siren, the screeching automobile tires, the roar of a forest fire, a fog horn, and several other things. And the sound of a wedding march. And these experts claim that one sound above all creates more charisma and arouses more expectancy than all of the rest of those sounds. And it's the sound of a wedding march. It's the sound of a family being started. And over the past couple of chapters in the Gospel of Luke, we've seen Jesus using the illustration of a wedding as an occasion to teach about his ministry what he's doing. In Luke 12, stay dressed for action like men who are waiting for the master to come home from a wedding. Luke chapter 14, we just saw this in the, a couple of weeks ago. But when you're invited by somebody to a wedding feast, don't try to sit in the place of honor or you'll be told to you know, go over there where you belong. Rather, sit in a low place that you might be brought higher. Weddings are festive occasions. And Jesus draws upon the wedding picture a number of occasions in his ministry to talk about what it is that he is doing as he gathers his church. So I want to go back and, and look at Christ's very first miracle. It's the miracle which the wedding motif sets the stage for his ministry. And to do this, I want to go back to John chapter 2, even though we're preaching through the Gospel of Luke. We'll take a pause here for just a couple of weeks, and we're going to look at this story in two parts. The wedding at Cana in John chapter 2 and verses 1 through 10. And let's read just the first five verses of this this morning. Let's stand together as we read God's holy and infallible word. On the third day, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. This is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Our gracious and merciful God, we ask that we may see the work of our Savior here, that we may look to him in all of our need, through Jesus Christ, we come to you. Amen. You may be seated. The Gospel of John opens with the very famous prologue, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The eternal is linked with the temporal. The temporal is revealed in, as the, the interpretation of the eternal. We see in Jesus, into glory, Itself, And then John shows us how this word made flesh gathered his disciples to himself. We find Jesus in Galilee at the end of chapter 1. He chose Philip and Nathaniel. And chapter 1 ends by kind of whetting our appetites for what Jesus promises to do in his ministry. Here's a band of brand new disciples. They really don't know what they're in for. They're completely unaware 
of the adventure that is in front of them. But they're committed to a Savior in whom they believe, uh, but a cause uh, about which they don't yet fully understand. And the last couple of verses of the first chapter of John kind of set the stage for this anticipation of Christ's ministry. Look at verses 48 through 51 of that last chapter. Nathanael said to Jesus, how do you know me? And Jesus answered him, before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus answered him, because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree. Do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, truly, truly, I say to you, you will see the heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Jesus is the Savior. He's the Savior to his disciples. He is the Savior to us. But in many ways, he was still a stranger to his disciples. So I want to look to, as we begin to see how Jesus manifests that which is spoken about him in John chapter 1 and verse 14, we beheld his glory the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And I want to look at this beginning of Christ's miracles. Luke doesn't cover this. John does. I'm going back here to look at this. And three observations. We're going to look at the first 11 verses here. Three things. First, and today we'll just see a, a little bit of it. Next week we'll concentrate on the miracle itself. We're going to see the setting, the Savior, and then the sign. The first observation here is the setting. And there's two aspects to note of this. First, the marriage, and then the mother. We find this occasion <clears throat> presented by John as a wedding, and it's after the <clears throat> excuse me, third day that Jesus goes in response to this invitation. We can note the significance of this wedding. And the first item of significance here is this is the third day. He's gained these two disciples, Philip and Nathaniel. He had up until this time been hidden from public view. We don't read of Christ's public ministry. He hasn't performed public miracles. This earthly ministry hasn't begun yet, but now on the third day, he's going to be revealed. He would commence his earthly ministry. Even in this, he is heralding the inauguration of his heavenly ministry. He would be hidden three days in the tomb. He would be revealed on the third day to commence his work as the resurrected Savior, and now comes Jesus to do his work in this third day. And it's rather remarkable, the scene that Jesus chooses to reveal himself, to, to reveal the beginning of his ministry. And this is the second item of significance. It's a, it's a marriage, a union. It's a holy matrimony, the occasion by which he chooses to reveal himself. Jesus begins his ministry with a celebration. He's going to the cross. It's a ministry that is going to be consummated at the cross and resurrection, but it begins not with an austere a sober, ascetic view bent on misery for himself and his companions. They would learn what it would mean to take up their cross and follow him, as we've seen in Luke. And in time, they would learn what it would be to bear the burden that he placed upon them, what it would mean to take his yoke upon themselves, and they would experience for themselves that this worker of miracles alone could make that yoke easy. He alone would make that burden light. They would learn in time what it meant to go to the cross. But here's quite a different view. His ministry begins the way it's going to proceed throughout eternity as a celebration of a great union, a great matrimony. And, and, and there is in this first scene of his public ministry an air of festivity about it, the joy of following after Jesus. Have you ever... I uh, met Christians who believed it was their business to be cheerless. They descend upon every occasion like a cloud of doom. The more strained their expressions, then clearly the more spiritual their intentions. And they go about like mimes of Grant Wood's American and Gothic. And Charles Spurgeon, in his lectures to my students, remarks about a Christian's uh, deportment. He says this, I love a person who, whose face invites me to make him my friend, a man on whose doorstep you read welcome rather than beware of dog. Give me a man around whom children come like flies around a honeypot. They're first class judges of good men. A man who is to do much with men must 
love them and feel at home with them. An individual who has no genealogy about them had better be an undertaker and bury the dead because they'll never succeed in influencing the living. No text in scripture is going to teach us that it's a crime to be happy. This is the joy of the kingdom that we ought to know, even as we journey to the cross, the joy of bearing burdens that are easy and yokes that are light, the joy of a bride longing for her groom. This is a fitting foretaste of what Christ is inaugurating. It brings us to the third item of, of significance. He's beginning his ministry for the, first, for the purpose of calling out for himself a bride. His church, his saints, they were to be united to him in birth and in life and in death and in resurrection and in eternity. John 1 tells us that in the beginning was the word and all things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made. And there's a reference there, as we've seen in the past, that goes all the way back to Genesis 1 in the beginning. And intrinsic to that creation was the ordinance of marriage. Marriage marked a commencement, a beginning. Jesus commences, he begins his work, demonstrating a support for the institution of marriage, a union between husband and wife, a model, a type of the heavenly marriage between Christ and his church, his bride, that begins with his disciples as he's calling his bride out for himself. This is the thematic theme in the Gospel of John. John in chapter 3 <clears throat> refers to himself as the friend of the groom. In Luke chapter 5, the Pharisees accuse uh, Jesus' disciples of not fasting. You, you ought to be sufficiently uh, uh, miserable. And Jesus says, well, can, can, the, can you make wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? The days of fasting are going to come. But the bride should rejoice at the coming of the bridegroom. And Matthew likens Christ's earthly ministry to a wedding feast. Matthew 22, the, the parable of the king's wedding feast for his son. John sees Jesus as the groom and a rejection of the invitation of the groom as the rejection of Jesus. Now, why does John present the commencement of Christ's ministry as this wedding feast? It's because the consummation of Jesus with his saints is described as a wedding banquet. A wedding banquet between the Lamb and His bride, the church. And John presents that to us in John in Revelation chapter 19. The ministry is presented as a, as a marriage. The church is given the challenge then as the bride waiting for the groom. The church is given the challenge to prepare herself, make herself ready for the marriage of the Lamb. When Christ isn't a guest there, Christ is the groom there. So this is a festive occasion. We read about it in Revelation 19. Let us be glad. Let us rejoice. For the marriage of the Lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready. So the marriage is the scene that Christ chooses as a backdrop to the inauguration of his ministry. It's a fitting portrait of what his work's going to be, his creative work, his redemptive work, his eternal work. The second aspect to note here is not just the marriage, but the mother. The mother of Jesus figures prominently in this passage, and we can't overlook her. Much of the world makes much of Mary to the point almost of idolatry, but that should not cause us to ignore her. And we ought to recognize how Jesus features her prominently in this passage. But it's not to point her out as a mediatrix, but as a mother. And she's doing what mothers do. She's using the influence of her grown son to help her out in a situation. We'll see two things about Mary here. First, her desire. Second, her disposition. First, her, her desire. The very first verse indicates that she's there at the wedding. The second verse tells us that Christ and his disciples are also invited to the wedding. And as invited guests, they want to participate in the festivities, and so they want wine to drink. And when they inquire about it, Mary looks at Jesus and says in verse 3, they have no wine. Now, this, this is a big deal. It may not seem you know, particularly significant to us, uh, but wine was considered a staple article of food. The rabbis had a saying, 
with no wine, there is no joy or something you know, along those lines. And then the, the, the problem is further compounded by the fact that to make wine, you can't just send the servants out back and, you know, have them stomp some grapes uh, because this is wine, they're not grape juice. The grapes had already been harvested. It had been several months since they had been harvested. They had been fermenting. This is actual wine. We know this further by the fact that verse 10 refers to the fact that, that only after people have had quite a bit to drink will the host bring out the inferior wine. Interesting uh, way to put had enough to drink. Uh, verse 10, the word uh, translated have drunk freely could probably at least more uh, better give the meaning if we translated it have become satiated refers to inebriation. And the idea, of course, is that the host, after he recognizes that the, uh, uh, the tongue, uh, the senses of the palate of his guests has been sufficiently dulled, uh, then he'll bring out, you know, the, the, the cheap stuff. They won't be able to tell the difference at that point. Now, Jesus obviously isn't condoning drunkenness. There's sufficient passages of other places in Scripture that deal with that. It's merely pointing to the custom of the host here. It demonstrates this is necessarily uh, wine being produced. One commentator puts it this way. The wine that was needed was not mere grape juice. It wasn't generic fruit of the vine. It's an intrinsically silly idea, uh, says uh, this guy. Well, it does present a serious problem. Because, again, you can't run down to Circle K and grab a bottle of Welch's. You can't just squish some grapes. You can't just start the dessert course and hope everybody forgets that you ran out of the uh, wine. Uh, the Jewish wedding wasn't a one-day event. It lasted a week or more. Wine featured very prominently in it. And running out of it was a serious humiliation. Not only that, but running out of wine was more than just an embarrassment. It had possible legal repercussions to it. In some circumstances, it was possible for the bride's family to take legal action against the groom if he failed to provide adequately for the ceremony. In other words, this isn't just an inconvenience here. So Mary's desire is noble to see that this family's need is provided for. And she doesn't tell Jesus what to do. In fact, if you notice, she doesn't even ask Jesus to do anything. She merely mentions the need, indicating her desire that that need be met. And that's exactly how Jesus takes her remark, as we see in verse 4. But that brings us to, to witness the second thing about Mary. Not only her desire, but her disposition. We're going to see how Jesus responds to her in, in a minute. Maybe a little surprising. It's not, uh, yes, yes, right away, Mom. Uh, it's almost a rebuke. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said, woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. Now, you adult uh, young men, um, if you said this to your mom, how do you think she would respond? And yet, Mary, with complete submission, complete confidence in her Lord and Savior, not bothered by it all, she simply turns to the waiters and says, do whatever he tells you. She has no assurance that Jesus is going to do anything at all. Just do whatever he tells you. But she has perfect confidence that he would do what was best, even if it wasn't what she wanted to be done. She exhibits a gracious spirit. She exhibits a humble, submissive heart. What an example to us. Because we want God to act now and in the way that we designate. Because, of course, we know what's best about our own lives and our own circumstances. Mary just says, do whatever he tells you. We so often feel the urgency to resolve our perceived problems with our own methods. Mary leaves them quietly and confidently to her Savior. And this turns our focus to the next observation. So we've seen the setting, these aspects of the marriage and the mother. Now look at the Savior. It's our second point. And I want to see regarding the Savior, first, his relationship with his mother, and then second, the revelation of his miracle. First, look at the way that he responds to his mother. There's this dynamic interplay here in our text between uh, Jesus and Mary. And it's a secondary act here to the overall uh, drama of this narrative, and yet one that comports perfectly with the theme that we find here, Jesus revealing himself as the Messiah. When Mary tells Jesus the host has no more wine, Jesus responds and says, Woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour is not yet come. 
Now, up to this point, as I've mentioned, Jesus has never performed a public miracle. And we can surmise that because verse 11 tells us that this event is the beginning of miracles. Uh, Mary knew, however, Christ's authority. She knows his power. She has trust that he will do, uh, that he will do what he ought to do, then he will know what to do, and that he can do it. And yet, she also has an understanding of him that isn't quite sufficient. Not yet. She had seen Jesus as a baby. She'd guided his hands over that little hammer when he first got his first little wooden toy set. She'd rocked him to sleep at night. She'd held him by the waist as he took his first steps. She was his mother, and he was her son. And that's how she saw him. And the wording of Christ's response to Mary is it's a bit unfortunate in our text because the English doesn't really have an equivalent um, he responds, woman, what does this have to do with me? That sounds pretty disrespectful. Uh, guys, I wouldn't advise you speaking to your mom in that way. Uh, the NIV, it's not literal, but it does capture the sense for us. It renders Christ's response this way. Dear woman, why do you involve me? Woman in the English sounds kind of condescending. Again, don't go home and call your mom woman. Uh, that's not a good idea. A dear woman... It's not accurate, but it conveys the idea. In other words, Jesus isn't talking down to her. He's not disrespecting her in any way. The word woman could be used in an honorable sense, indicating the person described by the word uh, presented the ideal of what that word is. There's a sense in which Jesus is saying of Mary, you're the, you're the ideal woman. You're a dear woman. You're the Proverbs 31 woman, we might say. And this is, in fact, the way Jesus addresses her as he is dying on the cross. He affectionately entrusts her to the care of, of John. And the tense of this word indicates a term of respect or affection. It's affectionate, but it's still unusual. Jesus doesn't use the term mother. He's putting a little bit of distance between her position as his mother and his position as her Lord. There's a new relationship between them as he enters on his public ministry. His family ties are subordinate to his divine calling. He does the bidding of his father who is in heaven, and that has priority over the request of his earthly mother. He gently informs his mother that he's to be considered the son of man, not the son of Mary. And so he continues, what does this have to do with me? Now, here's another uh, little tricky uh, phrase. That's why it's um, translated differently in, in different versions. Literally, it reads this way, which is kind of stilted, and that's why it's not translated in your Bibles. It reads, what to me and to you? In the King James, they put it this way, what have I to do with thee, the NIV, why do you involve me? So you can see there's a number of ways to, to translate. And again, the English comes across as rather abrupt and rather harsh, but this was a fairly common conversational phrase. And what the text doesn't tell us is uh, Jesus' face when he says this and his tonal inflection and the way that he's standing. When you said this phrase sharply, it could be a rebuke. But when it's spoken gently, it could simply be that you're correcting a, a misunderstanding. Mary misunderstood. She wanted him to respond to her request, but she doesn't recognize that Jesus responds to the will of his heavenly Father. One commentator renders the phrase this way, don't worry, you don't quite understand what's going on, leave things to me, and I'll settle them in my own way. There is, in, in Christ's words, there's a very gentle rebuke. There's a very loving, there's a very measured response to his human mother with, with limited understanding, with human emotions, changing emotions as she sees her divine son grow up before her eyes that he must, as he's told her before, he must be about his father's business, not hers. But it also served to remind her of something else. Mary had held him as a baby, but now she must come to him as her Lord in the same way that every other person must come to Jesus. She could not view him as other mothers view their sons. She has to come to him as the Messiah. 
She must trust in him for eternal provision. She must trust in him for food and for drink, true food, true drink, far greater than any that she had supplied and a far greater consequence than wine or bread. Why? Because of the cross. Because he was her savior. And so he tells her, my hour is not yet come. The work that I do is my father's work and I will work that work precisely when it is time for me to do that work. Christ's work is conditioned by his hour. By his will. When Christ knew that the moment decreed by God had arrived, then Jesus would act. And not a moment before. My hour has not yet come. What hour? Which Jesus uh, referring to. This term hour is one that John uses throughout his, his writings to refer to a number of high points in the ministry of Jesus, to refer to the cross, his exaltation, the consummation of his earthly ministry. That time hasn't yet come. But how is that an answer to Mary? Well, perhaps we can gain insight to this by a couple of verses given to us by John. John 4.23, the hour comes and now is when true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. John 5, the hour is coming and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God and they that hear shall live. When is this hour? It's not yet, Jesus says, but it's coming. What's John doing here? In the very beginning of Christ's ministry, he's, he's wetting your appetite. He's preparing you. Trace the ministry of Jesus from this marriage to the cross. Trace the work of Jesus. Anticipate this approaching hour to be released from your perception of temporal need and see Jesus not as a good teacher or a good son or a good man or a good miracle worker or somebody who can do things that are needed when necessary, that you can call on him when you're in need of something, but contemplate the Savior Contemplate the cross. Recognize him as the one who manifests the glory of God among us. The hour of Jesus' death and resurrection and ascension is in the first half of John's gospel, constantly said to be not yet. The beginning of chapter 12, the, the Gentiles come to worship and say, we would see Jesus. And Jesus answers them and says, the hour is come. The Son of Man should be glorified. See, the beginning of miracles was just that, a beginning. A beginning designed to direct our attention. Designed to direct our attention, our thoughts, in the direction of what is coming. In the direction of the cross and the resurrection, the ascension, the consummation. This is why John reports in verse 11, they witnessed his glory. Not his consummate glory. Not all of his glory and all of its array, but they saw a glimpse of the glory that was going to be revealed. And we're going to look next week at the revelation of the miracle. We're going to see Jesus as the groom. We're going to see the, the banquet, the feast, the revelation of his glory. But until then, we pause here and let's fix our eyes on Jesus, the eternal Son of God, who takes the water of Christ like Christlessness and changes it into the wine of the richness of the fullness of eternal life. He comes to offer the wine of eternal life. He comes to offer salvation. He comes to give his life. He comes to point us in the direction of the cross to tell us that the hour is coming and to invite us to come to him, to confess our sins, to recognize our true need. It's not wine. It's not earthly food. It's not that which is material. It is to glorify God forever. It is to repent of our sin and trust in Christ for salvation. Come to him, Jesus is inviting you, who alone is able to feed you with the riches of his banquet table. Come to him. See him as he is, the intercessor, the giver of life, the salvation of souls, the salvation of your soul. Jesus is the bridegroom who gives up his life for the bride. And he begins his ministry here with this wedding feast to point us ultimately to the hour that is to come, the hour of the cross, when Jesus will give up his life. The groom will die for the bride. A couple of years ago in California, Joe and Esther Mogoza are enjoying their wedding reception when two uninvited guests show up with baseball bats and they begin attacking at the wedding reception. 
and the groom intervened only to be pummeled by bats, to be bashed in the head, to be beaten to the point of death. At two o'clock in the morning, the morning after his wedding, he died. It was a senseless violence, tragic, unnecessary death. His wife Esther left a widow and Satan would love nothing more than to spoil the wedding and to attack the bride. But Jesus, as the bridegroom, gives his life for his people, but he doesn't leave his bride a widow. It is not a senseless death. His life is not taken from him in a tragic act of random violence. He lays down his life. It is given by him in an act of gracious atonement. And he dies so that we might not be bereaved, but that we might rejoice. And he points us to this marriage supper. He points us to this wedding that we might look forward to the marriage supper of the land. He points us to the day when he will return and perfect his bride and take her home. And that's what we come to today. As we come to the Lord's table, we come to a picture of the marriage supper of the Lamb. We come to a wedding feast. Well, that's not much of a feast there. It's some crackers and a thimble full of, of wine. That's not, uh, there's not a lot here uh, going on. But that's exactly the point. It's to point us to the greater feast. It is to point us to the banquet supper of the Lamb. It is to point us to glory that our eyes might be taken from these visible elements and lifted up to heaven that we might look for our bridegroom to come. And as we look for his coming, let's humble ourselves before him. And let's now see Jesus as he is and approach his banquet feast. Let's pray. Our gracious and merciful Father, we ask that as we come to this wedding feast, as we come to this supper that points back to what you have done, present in what you are doing for your bride, perfecting her, and what you will do, the marriage supper of the Lamb, we pray that we might humble ourselves before you and see you and see Jesus not as the conveyor of great deeds of delight, not as a good son and a good miracle worker, but as our great God, our Lord and Savior, as we pray in his name. Amen. Let's respond by singing 279 as we prepare for the Lord's Supper. 279, O Christ, our King, Creator, Lord. Let's stand and sing 279. Christ our King, Creator, Lord, Savior of all who trust your word, to them who seek thee ever near, now to our praises bend your ear. In your dear cross the grace is found, it flows from old dreaming wood, whose power and earth controls, breaks the firm bond and frees our souls. Thou didst create the stars of night, yet thou hast veiled in flesh thy light. As thine amours were born to wear, a mortal's painful love to bear. When thou didst hang upon the tree, the quaking earth acknowledged thee. When thou didst there yield up thy prayer, Now in the Father's glory high, free conqueror never more to die, thus by thy mighty power defend, and bring through ages 
Hallelujah. You may be seated. Matthew chapter 26 and verses 26 through 29, we read these words. Now, as they were eating, Jesus took a bread and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is the blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Our Lord Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper as an ordinance to be observed until his coming again. Well, this is not a re-sacrificing of Jesus. It is a remembrance of the once-for-all sacrifice of Jesus Christ nor is a mere, nor is it just a, a, a memorial, a kind of a memory of what Jesus did for us. It is a means of grace, a means by which we are sanctified, made to be more like Christ. The Holy Spirit works in us through this means. He strengthens us in our warfare against sin. He calls us to obedience as we follow Jesus to the cross. He confirms in this supper that he is faithful, that he is true, that he has fulfilled the promises that he's made to us, that he took upon himself the curse of the disobedience of Adam, the disobedience of us. And he bore our sins on the cross. Jesus took his sins upon himself. And the Lord's Supper is also a bond and a pledge of the communion that the believers have with one another as we are members of the body of Christ. We being many are one bread and one body. We are all partakers of that one bread, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians. And the Lord's Supper anticipates the consummation of the ages when the Lord returns to gather his redeemed people, when he returns to gather his bride and to deliver us to his heavenly wedding feast. It is my privilege as a minister of Christ to invite all who are right with God and his church through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, to come to this table. If you have received Christ and you are resting upon him alone for salvation, as he's offered to you in the gospel, if you are a baptized and professing communicant member of a church where the gospel of God's free grace is preached faithfully, if you live penitently, if you have confessed your sins, and you live not in ongoing sin, but you continue to confess, continue to be sanctified, then this supper is for you, and I invite you in the name of Christ to come eat of the bread and drink of the cup. At the same time as we often read in 1 Corinthians 11, the Bible says that we ought to take time to examine ourselves, that in eating of this bread and drinking of this cup in an unworthy manner, not believing, not being a member of the church where the Bible is faithfully preached and taught, not having professed your faith, harboring sin in your heart. When you come and eat of this bread and drink of this cup, you eat and drink judgment to yourselves. It becomes a sacrifice of judgment for you. But that warning isn't aimed to keep us away from the table. That Paul says, examine yourself and then eat. Make it right what isn't right. Perhaps you're unable to come today and make right what isn't right so that you can come. Let's take a few moments, examine our hearts that we might indeed, and in examining our hearts and minds, determine whether the discernment to come is ours, that we might partake to the glory of God and our growth in grace through Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Oh Lord, we humble ourselves before you as we come to your table, as we prepare to eat this bread and drink this cup. And we are reminded in your word of its significance. It isn't just a, a token. 
But as we come in faith, your Holy Spirit works with this sacrament in us, takes the word of God that was preached, takes this bread and this wine and uses it to work in us holiness, to renew us in righteousness, in knowledge, to make us more like Christ and less like this world. And we thank you for Jesus because we alone are not worthy to come. But we come in union with Christ. We come because we have died in Christ. We have been crucified with Christ, as Paul says, and resurrected with him. And so now feed us that we might be strengthened to do your work, to follow to the cross, to give our lives, literally, every part of our being, to give our lives materially, if necessary, to go even to a cross, to follow you to glory. Through Christ we pray. Amen. Beloved congregation, lift up your hearts from these visible elements, even to heaven itself, where we look for Jesus to return and to perfect our redemption. All of the promises of God are yes and amen in Jesus Christ. Every spiritual blessing is found in him. And so with, this is after all, a wedding feast, joyful hearts in Christian love, let us partake of what God has provided for us to his glory and to our good.
Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be upon you and abide with you all, both now and always. Go with joy, my friends, and witness the great marriage supper of the Lamb, even in your own lives. Celebrate what God has done for you through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord Jesus.